It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the opening of uh, Katie Hulton, Drawn to the Edge. Um, it is, it is, it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to um, introduce Katie for a second time. Uh, we're welcoming her back for her second lecture at NOMA. Her first lecture was uh, on January 20th, uh, earlier this year, when she was a resident at the Studio in the Woods. And a lot of her research, which informed this, her installation, Drawn to the Edge, um, grew out of her time uh, at Studio in the Woods. And um, we, I feel so fortunate that she was willing to commit even more time to Louisiana and um, to looking at our, um, at our environment and our issues here. So just, just to remind you a little bit about Katie, uh, Katie grew up in the Irish countryside and studied at the National College of Art and Design in Dublin and the Ho Hochschule der Kunst in Berlin. Um, after representing Ireland at the Venice Biennale in 2003, she moved to New York City on a Fulbright scholarship. She's still based more or less in New York, but she makes, uh, I should say, she travels to residencies all over the country and all over the world. Uh, this fall, she'll be in Prague working on another art installation. And just before coming to NOMA, um, she uh, produced a work for the um, uh, Sculpture Garden at Storm King. So uh, there are so many people, when you work on an installation this large, there are so many people who are involved and so many people to thank. So I just want to um, mention all the staff that put in long hours and all the, all the people who help. So uh, most of you all are here tonight. So um, Ann Roberts, Will Souter, Ellen Bull, Scott Dow, Morgan Hughes, uh, Christian Rappel, Taylor Shepard, Nina Schwanze, um, all, all of you who put, on, uh, put in long and uh, much appreciated hours, we am so grateful to you. Um, I also want to thank um, the sponsors uh, who contributed to this exhibition, um, the Houghton Shield Garage Foundation, the Joan Mitchell Center, Ellie, Merritt and Ellie Lane, the Sheraton Hotel, um, and Edwin Cohen and Victoria Shaw. Thank you so much. So, and I want to um, also make sure that I give a, a huge, huge, huge thank you to Katie. We are so grateful for all the time you spent with us and for all the effort and thought, and um, we appreciate it so much. So thank you very much. Katie Holton. Hi, thanks, Miranda. Um, and I need to thank everybody, all the, the same people that Miranda just listed, so I probably shouldn't go through the list. You all know who you are, and I'm deeply grateful. Um, so, and hopefully I'll get to thank you all personally as well later. <laughs> I'm kind of a bit shattered. We finished, um, I think it was 8 o'clock this morning. We'd been working through the night. Um, so forgive me if I am not able to form complete sentences. <laughs> I'll do my best. So I thought I'd start with, um, like Miranda mentioned, I already spoke here back in January, um, so I thought it might be nice just to spend the time to talk about the show and the work that's outside. Um, so I'm going to start with, this is my studio, well, the porch at the studio in the woods, and this is where I spent most of my time. The residency at the studio in the woods was really, um, it was six weeks where I got to spend, for me the, the most important thing was to have a, a base and spend some time in New Orleans. Um, Susan Taylor, had, the director of the museum, came to my studio last year and I was at the time doing a lot of research for a project at the Salina Art Center in Kansas and it was um, water research. I was interested in, or was commissioned to, to look at the city and its relationship with water and infrastructure. Um, and so Susan saw the, the work and thought, wow, it, that could be really um, you know, exciting to, to bring that kind of uh, way of looking at a city to New Orleans, because obviously you've got such an, uh, you know, a deep intrinsic connection with water. So the, the studio in the woods was my time, my six weeks to be here, um, and obviously a little bit outside of the city because it's a 30 minute drive. So I um, essentially used it as a, a way to, um, to to gather all of my books and all the stuff that you, everybody, you know, you want to, or me, I always want to like sit down and read and find out about a place, but usually don't have the time and the luxury to sit and read a book. So I, um, I really spent a lot of time here and also went out on um, expeditions. I had a driver, um, Monique Verdun, uh, brought me on um, 
uh, drives with Richie Blink, brought us out on the Mississippi River, um, and I spent time walking, doing really simple things. I wasn't producing artworks. That was the luxury. I didn't have, you know, to make an, a show right at the very end of the six weeks, which meant that I, a lot of the time was just focused on, on thinking and, um, and really um, getting a sense of, of the place and where it fit with me and where I fit with it. Um, and so these are just some of the things that I would collect. You know, I'd go for a walk, you know, maybe um, every day and then just gather the things. And this um, was from a show I had at the, the Hugh Lane Museum in Dublin. Um, and I, I wanted to include it because, uh, unfortunately here, I don't think it looks like it's a, a blue turquoise background, but it's a twig that's installed on a wall of the museum. And the wall was painted this, uh, it's called Cosmic Turquoise, which is one of the, the drawings outside the big cloud that's up um, on the top right, um, has the same color, but unfortunately here it doesn't look the same. Um, and so this was just another found object, so kind of similar to, to these objects that I found at, find on my walks. This was when I was in Dublin, um, and I just changed it slightly. I, the, the twig becomes is black on this, the turquoise brown, brown, sorry. Um, and the, the cosmic turquoise, it's kind of a, um, a very specific color. Um, it's the average color of the universe as determined by uh, scientists at Johns Hopkins University. Um, they realized with all of their the data and the information that they had doing, you know, completely a lot of different research, they realized when they calculated all of this information together, they could determine what the average color of the universe is at, that we can see, that, you know, man can actually see. Um, and they came up with this turquoise. They realized a couple of months later when they recalculated that it was incorrect. So it became officially the incorrect average color of the universe. And for me, the, this, um, the beauty of having something that's so, um, well, one thing it is, unfortunately here you can't see, but it is this really beautiful um, color. But it's also trying to claim, like we, mankind, we're trying to claim that, hey, we, we understand, we know what's out there in the universe and um, we can state that this is the average color, but it's, it's all wrong. And I think that's something that's really at the heart of a lot of my work. It's, you know, me personally trying to get to grips and understand the places where I am, um, but also on a larger scale, um, us as communities and, and, you know, civilization, how we relate to the planet um, and our understanding with it and these, where there's kind of the gaps and we think we understand one thing and we know how they work together but maybe they don't quite work like that. Um, and so the cosmic turquoise is something that I discovered a few years ago and I've, I've used it in a number of different installations, um, literally as a ground, that's why I just paint the, the walls and would place things on it. Um, and so I just included this as a, um, a uh, sculptural work that I made, um, and it, it was just using recycled materials. So I think I just included it as a way to, to show that my work tends to be using whatever is lying around, whatever happens to be in a space when I get there. This was at the Contemporary um, Art Museum in St. Louis. And I just asked the, the curator and the staff of the museum to keep all of the, the garbage and the rubbish from the installations before me. And then when I got to the museum, I kind of pulled it all together and uh, strapped it together and taped it um, and it's all wrapped with black duct tape um, and it's you know a, a life scale a life-size replica of a flowering dogwood um, so then back to the studio in the woods um, I, yeah so i would collect things this is some spanish moss um, and its shadow and so because i had this really quiet oops sorry this really quiet time i was able to to sit and notice how the, the shadows move, you know, very simple things. So I, s I made a series of drawings, um, just really simple. Um, and that, I think that simple, um, you know, fundamental thing, you have a shadow and it moves very slowly and gently um, with something that kind of came back um, or I thought a lot about that time when I was at the, the studio in the woods, how having that time it's, and to, to think and to, to kind of relate and look at these, these little things that normally, you know, I, I, I am based in New York and there's not so much time to sit around and, and look at how a shadow moves. Everybody's rushing and running and it's very stressful and hectic. And um, so I, I wanted to try and keep the, the calmness and the, this very um, fundamental connection with, you know, in a sense with the planet because we have these shadows because the sun is 
you know, the Earth is moving around the sun, and you know, very, um, very, I, th I think, simple things, but with very deep um, underlying. Uh, um, there we go. That's my lack of sleep now. <laughs> I'm losing words. So um, more of the the research that I was doing while I was here in January, February was. Um, you know, this is one of Harold Fisk's maps of the Mississippi River. So I got to kind of get a sense of how the river itself was like this living thing. You know, it moves like a snake. Uh, and I, I think it was something that I, I kind of know and understood that that's what happens in the world, but I had never seen maps like this before. And it's, you know, it's completely beautiful. Um, but the, the real sense that the, of how the city grew up to be here. Um, I was reading Richard Campanella's work and how you've got the, the whole, the, the basic bottom line is that New Orleans wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the river and all of the sediment that gets washed down from, you know, almost 50% of th of the country. So you've got the, the land that's here underneath our feet has come from the interior of the United States of America. So there's a real fundamental connection, and I think that goes back to to Kansas again. Because when I was in Kansas and um, I told people I was coming to New Orleans, they were like, "Oh well." that you're going to see uh, where all of our stuff ends up because all of the runoff from the farms, all of the, that water, you know, it runs um, into the Missouri River and then comes down the Mississippi. And this is actually where it comes out, right here. So I have to admit I'm completely in love with, um, with maps and looking at the planet. And this is one of the most beautiful parts of the entire country. It's just stunning. And I... Um, I kind of cheated because this is a map that NASA has, um, you know, I found it on one of their websites. And obviously it doesn't quite look like that. They've kind of, I don't know why they've made it so incredibly beautiful. Um, these blues and these greens, it's completely gorgeous. Um, but that's, that's kind of how I see it. We all know the reality is a little bit more different. Um, but it, th this, the pattern, you can see how, um, you know, how it's, it's very obvious you've got the river and then the sediment piled up. Uh, and for me, I'm interested in the mathematics of that. My dad was an accountant and a mathematician, and so the, the mathematics of how um, patterns appear and how they, they replicate and how one thing causes another thing to happen, like that knock-on effect, um, I think is really obvious here, almost in the fractal um, aspect. And so then more of my driving expeditions, you've um, got this incredible situation where you have motorways, so structures that man, that we have built through swamps. Like this is complete, it's so beautiful. It's, um, it's incredible. It's like, wow, how can that be? It shouldn't be there. You've, like it's not natural to have a road in a swamp. Like the logistics of constructing it, I can't even begin to imagine. But, but I just see it as being so beautiful how we've kind of worked with the land and how we're so connected with it. Um, and so these structures, it's all of, all of this stuff is what really um, fascinates me and what I'm interested in, you know, trying to investigate with the work that I do. Um, so this was my, my drive with Monique. I think this was the day we went to Venice. Um, so you can see how the, the road is basically surrounded by water. Um, and this is the fact that really, you know, I had heard the statistics that you lose um, a football field um, the size of land every 45 uh, minutes or an hour, every day, all day, um, constantly. Um, so I had kind of heard about that, but it wasn't until I was actually here and sitting at the studio in the woods, which is located right at the bend in the river, and so you hear the sound of the boats, um, and you're really, like, you're so close to it, you can almost touch it, and it, I just oh, constantly, every day, had this, um, this sense of, not doom, but um, it was like, wow, this, the land is literally disappearing. It was um, really something tangible that I, I felt um, kind of inside of me. Um, and so it was something that I, I thought was kind of astounding. Um, and the fact, that, the fact that it is a fact, and what can we do about it? Um, so obviously, people are doing things like this. Um, when you drive out, I think this is when we were going out to Shell Beach. Um, so this is, you know, there's a real reason that the, the house is constructed like this. To me, it's, it's beautiful. It, like, I'm like a tourist taking photos as I drive past, but this is the reality. This is how um, we've got to live if we're living in environments like this. Um, and this is the edge of the Mississippi River. I think this was when I was out in Richie's boat. So you can actually see, and the title of the show was really important for me to, to directly address the fact that I was looking at the edge. And the edge, for me, it has different meanings. It's not only like the literal edge here of 
where the, the land and the water meet, um, but the, the edges between um, people, between man and planet, um, and also um, even between a drawing and a sculpture. So there are lots of, of different meanings, but I was really um, interested in how, in how we can see so quickly the land changes. You look at one map, um, and it, you know you have the outline where the land and the water is, and you go up in an airplane and you can see that it's completely not like that. Or you talk to somebody who's out on a boat and they're like, well, we don't use the radar, because if you look at the radar, it says that we're going over land. Um, like the green dot of the radar is on top of a big land mass and it's completely open water. Um, so, and this, I think, from after we went out on the boat trip, I tried to uh, use Google Earth because I spent a lot of time on Google Earth flying around. And I think this was near where we were on the Mississippi River and then we went down one of these little channels. We were exploring these old abandoned forts. Um, and so you can just like see how totally gorgeous this all it is, but it's hard to tell what the scale of it is. Um, so I happen to know that that's the Mississippi River there, so that kind of gives you a sense of how large it is. But it could be something that's much more massive or it could be something that's much more tiny, like almost if you zoom in on your skin or something. And those, the macro and the micro scales, that's another thing that I'm completely, um, I don't know, it's just something I've always been obsessed about and I think maybe it goes back to the mathematics and these underlying laws of how everything is, um, is connected. So you've got the man-made and the natural and they all kind of, whatever the mathematics are, um, these growth patterns repeat in different ways. Um, and I have some, some city drawings that I'll show later where I, I kind of end up looking at cities as, as the almost like these natural living organisms that, that, that grow even though it's a man-made um, thing. And so this was at the fort, we um, saw all kinds of things, but this was some kind of a wall. These are shells, clam shells, and then there's bits of brick and all kinds of things, and then you know the roots growing down. So these are man-made structures completely um, overgrown. So loads, like you can see oyster shells, it's completely like beautiful and, um, and bizarre because it's just sitting there totally abandoned. Um, but so beautiful and I included um, lots of shells and, and stones and bricks that I collected on different little wanderings that I've made in some of the vitrines. That, so the vitrines are around the edges of the Great Hall and they, in a sense, um, are like little uh, props to kind of give you, the, the viewer um, who's looking at these really massive, huge drawings, it's kind of a, a little smaller, more intimate way to look at where the work is coming from and um, literally to like engage with the narrative because there's text and there are pages from books that um, kind of mean a lot to me. But um, And so I use the little shells and, and these found objects as, as props to, to lean a book page against or to place on top of something else. Um, and this, I was so excited to be out here. I'm such a romantic, so to go to a place like Venice was, um, I was just, I had to take a, this is a screenshot from my phone and this was proof that I was actually there. So this is more like a realistic map so you can see what's going on here. Um, but it's still, it's still beautiful. It's such an amazing structure. Um, yeah, and so then this is one of the sketches. So when I was at the studio in the woods, I, I um, as usual, because I'm always, you know, I'm a drawer. I, I can't, you know, I just make drawings and doodles and sketches. And um, I try to get maps of, because I noticed when I was um, looking here, I was like, well, okay, oh, oops, sorry. You've got these, these black splodges, and I think we can kind of guess what they are, maybe. But when you zoom in, there's not a single um, platform, or you can't see anything. They've all been removed. They're not there. Um, so I try to, you know, I Googled, try to find some, some of these maps. And this is um, just a sketch that I made, chalk on black paper of, um, this is the, the Gulf Coast here, the edge of Louisiana, and then the, all of the white dots are the, the platforms. And so one of the drawings outside that I call Constellation, and I should say that um, all, there are six drawings and they're all double-sided, so there's a drawing on both sides. Um, and so the large black one, um, which is white on black on one side and black on white on the other, they are, um, I don't know if I have the map here. I think the map is further on, but it's all of the oil um, and gas wells in Louisiana. And so Jacob Rosenzweig support, supplied the map for me because it's very hard to get an up-to-date one. Um, and so this is just a little sketch and the lizard was just in my studio running around, <laughs> happy. Um, and then this is another sketch of using sediment that I collected from the riverbank. Um, and it's blown up huge here, but it was actually quite a small, just an eight and a half by 11 inch. And a lot of the, the drawings that I make are that size. Um, and that was, and that's another thing I need to say is that the, 
this whole show is kind of completely blown um, everything up out of, um, you know, all, I don't know what I, what the beginning of that sentence, <laughs> how it should end. But um, basically, the, a lot of these drawings and sketches were very small scale. They were like this, this size. Um, and the work, works in the Great Hall are obviously a completely different scale. For me, it was really important to, because I feel so strongly about all of these very, um, to me, fundamental issues that are right there under our noses, to, to make it completely obvious. So that when you walk in, you've got this really massive image and it's so large you can't not notice it you have to address it um, and so I uh, that's one reason that the the drawings are at the scale that they're at um, so this is just another and these are just um, sketches that I made again looking at little um, uh, ma land masses on Google Earth um, and then this is black and white a lot of my work tends to be black and white so this is one of the the water um, when you've got the water channels that come in and this ended up being a sketch for one of the larger drawings. Um, and so the positive and the negative, what is the, what's the land mass? Because technically the, all of the white is, is land, it's like solid matter, um, and the black is the watery area, but by flipping it, you kind of, there's a confusion, you, what's positive and what's negative. And this is Bayou Bienvenue, um, another one of the sites that I visited. So I, I um, collected water and sediment samples from as many uh, different spots around town as I, where, you know, the actual spots where I could go down and touch the water. Um, so this is one of the sites. And then I was um, lucky enough to get up in an airplane. While I was here at the studio in the woods, we tried, to, you know, Cami and Amy were great trying to help me um, organize a, a little airplane trip, but it, with the timing, it didn't quite work out. So when I came back, Rebecca Snedeker, um, who is, she's working on uh, Unfathomable City, an atlas for New Orleans um, that's going to come out next year. So she's working with Rebecca Solnit on that. And um, the two of us were kind of were working on a water map of the city. So it was the perfect opportunity to grab the time and to get up in an airplane and look down um, from up there. Because that was what I realized when I went out driving with Monique and we would get to the end of the road. And I'm standing there and I see the edge, you know, where the land and the water meet. And I was like, oh, I need to be up there. Because <laughs> I, all I was doing was trying to project what this looked like from above. And like I said, I spend a lot of time on Google Earth looking down. So um, I, I came back in May to spend you know, the time here working on the show. And immediately, like the second day I got here, um, myself and Rebecca hopped up in this plane with Charlie Hammonds. And it was completely awesome. I highly recommend if anybody has the opportunity to do it. It's amazing. It's so incredibly beautiful. Um, so we left from Humma and um, went down the bayou. And I had actually driven down to Kokodri. Um, my boyfriend Dylan came when I was on the residency. I don't drive myself, so I, uh, I kind of have to hitch rides with people. So Dylan became my driver. And so I actually knew it from the ground level, um, which was really helpful as well. Uh, so you can see here all of these shapes. So here's, uh, um, I think the previous drawings mightn't have made sense to you, but here you can see this would have been the black line and then the big blob. So they're just very natural forms that um, happen. Well, I, I say natural, but some of them are natural and some not so. And so here you can see how the road is, is on the ridge and then everything else is, it's like heaven almost. You don't know where's the land and the sky ending. Um, it's incredible. So I took hundreds and hundreds of photographs um, and it's, it's so fundamental for the whole project. I felt like I had to include some. So I, you know, I printed out a few little small images that are only like three by two inches and included them in one of the vitrines. Um, and in a sense, um, you know, each one of these tells a whole story. So it's almost like you could just present one of these and that's, there's so much happening here. Like this is the horizon over here. Um, and so you've, you've got all these issues that are happening. These are trees, so this would have been um, a cypress swamp, but now everything is dead. So you've got the salt water that's moving in, the land is changing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but again, it's, it's beautiful, so I'm really torn because we're up in the airplane and I'm like, oh my, I'm overwhelmed by how beautiful it is, but it's, it's a tragedy as well. So you've got... Um, this tug of war, and it's the same thing with the maps. I think the constellation maps that I make, um, like I, 
I'm completely in awe that, you know, man, that we can produce these, these systems, like all of those dots, every single dot, and there are thousands and thousands of them. They're all connected by pipelines, and this is like, that's a huge infrastructural, uh, um, like mind-boggling exercise to be able to do that, and it all kind of comes up into our kitchen and we can turn on um, the gas and, and cook. So it's all, like, it's a very fundamental basic. That's how we work as human beings on the planet. That's how things happen. But it's, um, it's also completely tragic and a disaster as well, but it's, it's beautiful. It's, so, it's, so that tension, like that's another edge that I'm interested in, um, this edgy uh, dynamic between the terror of the reality, because I find it completely terrifying, but it's also the reality and it's beautiful as well. It works, it what's, it's what makes us be able to be here, I guess. Um, so this reminded me of Monet's water lily drawings, <laughs> or paintings, I should say. Um, and so here again, it's very easy to see this structure that I was looking at. <coughs> More of the marsh. And it, so you can see here the, the water is, is brown, because obviously the, the Mississippi is, that's one of the things that struck me when I was here in January, February, is every time I did get to see the river, which wasn't that often, because it's so hidden and so hard to see behind the levee, is that it's, um, it's incredibly brown. And so my romantic notion of, oh, a big river, it should be, you know, this beautiful blue color, but of course it's got so much sediment in it that it's, <coughs> you know, it's incredibly um, rich with sediment, it's so brown. And so then I think here's um, an easy way to show what I'm talking about with the macro and the micro and the zooming in. So Google Earth, you know, you've got one view and then you zoom in. And this could be, again, at any scale because all of these patterns, they, they repeat and they move on. But it, and to me, it, it's almost like, um, you know, if you're <coughs> unfortunate enough to have moths and they, they eat your clothes or lace or all of these things kind of repeat. So then I wanted to show one of the drawings is, um, is clouds. It's... On one side, it's, um, it's on the cosmic turquoise background, and there are these two clouds here that are over Kokodri. Here's Kokodri here. <coughs> um, and so I went out, I feel really connected to the place because I went down and I met with Alex uh, Coker, a scientist at Lumcon. I went out in a canoe. So Charles and Rafe Eames' film Powers of Ten, where they, s they start off um, with a family who's lying on a picnic blanket in a park and you zoom out from them at you know, 10 meters. It, they have a logarithmic scale, so they move out at 10 meters every second or something. And so it zooms out into the farthest, farthest reaches of the universe and the cosmos and the furthest away galaxy. And then it zooms back in to the, the family on the blanket and then zooms inside of their body. And so you can see, uh, like, like literally see, the images replicating from the furthest distant reaches of the, the galaxies inside of the, the body and the systems that are happening in there, these clusters of um, organisms and cells and things. And so that's why so I kind of use Google Earth, I think, is a great way, it's a great tool for us to be able to do something similar. So I basically just took these two clouds and, and drew the two of them on, you know, to scale on one side. And then on the other side, um, so this is me drawing. So this is what I was able to do was project because I had this massive, huge studio in Mid City. Um, I had the luxury of like 20,000 square feet. So I was able to project Google Earth up there. And then this is my little pencil, just draw the outline. And so um, this is the studio, in fact. This is the second floor. So I had one floor that was like this downstairs, and then this was upstairs. And I also had a roof the same size. <coughs> so you can see. Um, how I was able to work on such a large scale, because my studio in New York is, is smaller than this little stage here. Um, uh, so it would not have happened. <laughs> um, and so I was able to work on all of them at the same time, which was, uh, it's how I work. I work on lots of things at the same time. So here's the, the singular cloud, and then on the, the reverse side and the back side are the two clouds, and then this is the constellation. Um, so it's just charcoal, graphite and charcoal, um, and then paint. To, this is the cosmic turquoise color. <coughs> and then I, I just threw this in. This was a piece I did last year for Dublin Contemporary. Um, I, I made it a public artwork in Dublin, um, Ireland. That's you know where I'm from. And so it was really 
a privilege to be able to work outside in the city, I used a found book um, by Lucretius, and I have a, included a copy in one of the vitrines. And what I did was I, I essentially just stole phrases out of the book, um, borrowed phrases. He wrote it in um, like 5000 BC. Or it's like completely mind blowing that this guy, he was like a poet, astro, or not an astrophysicist, but a <coughs> philosopher. Um, and he was talking about atoms and things that make up the reality around us before people had any conception of any of this. Um, he, you know, you read him today and it's like he's talking about what's happening today, our relationship with the universe around us and um, on different scales also. He, was, he would look at, you know, basically my relationship to this bottle and the fact that it's made up of things, the same things that I might be made up of, but we're different entities and we're all in the universe. And Anyway, so I just took some of these and then um, a friend of mine, Richard Moss, his parents are ceramicists and um, they offered to collaborate with me and these are each um, four inch square ceramic tiles um, hand painted with letters. So it's almost like Scrabble I collected. They gave me, I can't remember, like 200 letters and I had my book on the nature of things by Lucretius and so it was a matter of picking the, the phrases um, that I wanted that would work at each site. This is St. Stephen's Green in Dublin. So Grafton Street is right here, which is um, one of the, the luxurious shopping areas in, in Dublin. Um, and so this phrase, why clouds make sounds, all of them I think were quite ambiguous. It was kind of up to the viewer what they, they could read into it. Um, and anyway, I just wanted to include it because of the the clouds and because Lucretius is connected. So as you can see, a lot of my work for, for different shows, it's not like, oh, I'm doing a project for New Orleans and it's just for here and it doesn't relate to anything else that I do. Um, it's the complete opposite. Everything that I do, my whole body of work, it's all connected to, um, to everything else that I do. So the work that I did just before coming here, like at Storm King, um, and the work that I'm about to do when I leave here is all part of this same story that I'm telling. So. Um, and I think that's how the world works. Like we're all connected to each other and the stories that we tell are all connected and they, they have a reason that they're, they came about and they continue to grow. Um, and so it's just another shot of the studio. Oh, and here's the map that Jacob gave me. So you can see all of these yellow dots, the thousands and thousands of them. Um, and so what I did was I blew it up. So on the black side you have um, one area and then on the white side you have another area. And so you can see there, there are clusters and there's reasons that there, there are clusters in particular areas. That's where it's, it's rich with uh, what we need. So it's like, you know, the clusters, to me it was a very obvious mirroring that they, they um, it's not a coincidence that they look like a night sky. Because um, it's just this way that the world is that you've got these clusters and these formations that happen. So that's the, the black on white side, so it's just charcoal on gesso. Um, and there's the black, so that's how I would draw it. I would just draw the outlines and then fill it in. And again, that's my shadow. And so I've never, I'm not figurative, I don't use the body, um, but I've recently, like in the, in the last couple of months, started to use, whoops, started to use my own um, shadow. And I don't know if this is because I'm getting older and suddenly starting to think about me and not being around for very long or whatever. But I think the simple things, again, like the shadow and the presence um, is something that I've included. And one of the pieces that didn't end up in the show was a sun clock. I'll show some images of that later. Um, so I wanted to include this image of um, Western Kansas. So this is uh, completely and utterly astounding. This is, so you can see here's Kansas. It's all flat, like everybody says. But then you've got this going on. Um, and it's all chalk. This, um, I didn't know this before. This was when I was on the residency at the Salina Art Center. Kansas was the bottom of the ocean. At one point, America had this huge inland ocean, so it was almost like America was two islands surrounded by op um, ocean, and you had these huge like dinosaur fish things that would swim around. And all of this was, fo was formed as the, um, the sea fish and the, the shellfish and everything fell down in over millions of years formed chalk and so the, the drawing uh, the drawings outside where I have the, the white chalk is actually chalk that I I borrowed <laughs> Ooh, whoops <laughs> sorry um, that I borrowed or took or I don't like to say stole but um, that I found here so it's another found object 
And for me, the, the fact that you know, this was something that took millions of years to form from living things, it's completely astounding. And to, to use it, you know, when you rub it on the black surface, it just you know, chalks off. Um, so it's something that's a very personal thing, I think, working. And Nina, who was helping me with drawing, she said it as well. Wow, this chalk is so beautiful. Just to work with it is gorgeous. And I don't know if that comes across when you look at the drawing, but the actual physicality of, of working with something that's come you know, from here, it's, um, it's incredible. And so I wanted to include this just to show how you know, directly. So what I did here directly relates to Kansas and, again, like they said, you know, the scientists and the farmers there told me when I was in Kansas that all of the water from there ends up, not all of it, but, you know, most of it ends up coming here. So you have this connection here with something that's so far away and so different. Um, and th so this was some of the work that I made. Um, this was actually a, a drawing I made of the Smoky Hill River, which is this big line here. And then these are the smaller tributaries. And I, I made a scale model um, of the Smoky Hill River to 4.56 meters long um, and for me that correlated with the 4.56 billion years of Earth's history so I was using the Smoky Hill River like a timeline um, and this was another timeline here of books that I borrowed from the Salina library the public library so it was like 756 books that told the history of planet Earth starting over here um, at year zero when the planet was formed and then ending up over here today. And the books went chronologically telling the history of planet Earth through water, because this exhibition was all about water. Um, and then this was a water atlas that I made. But I'm including this because the um, I was completely struck that this, this is actually what the Smoky Hill River looks like, and these are the tributaries. And when I drew it out, I had just been visiting the museums there, and it was like this looked, the form looked just like these large fossilized dinosaurs that they had in the, the museums. So the fish that used to swim around here, when you had the huge dinosaur fish swimming around, looked like this river. And it's all, you know, just a coincidence. These are the forms that we have in the world. So I, what I did was I constructed the, the drawing into three dimensions, because I'm very interested in, you know, a two-dimensional drawing becoming a three-dimensional thing. So I used um, newspaper and papier mache, and one of these little tributaries that didn't get included here um, is in the vitrine outside. Um, and so, in a way, I'm kind of selfish because with works like that, I don't know if the viewer is going to, they're not going to know. There's no way they, they can know any of this and what I just told you. But for me, it's, it's kind of all connected. So a lot of my work is, um, is me placing things out there and it kind of, it's open-ended how it's interpreted. And I really like that, um, this open-endedness. So I'm, I don't want to say this is what you should think and this is what this is. It's, it's just for you that to, to come up with your own conclusions, like that's how the world is. And so this, um, again, I, so I was kind of struck when I started making this drawing, which is the 36 by 12 foot drawing. Um, the it ended up kind of looking like this fossilized bone. So again, that's going back to the, the fossils. And um, the, the it's all um, made using sediment that I collected from the river. This sediment actually came from the fly. It's really, really gorgeous mud. It's beautiful, like um, melted chocolate almost. Um, and so the image itself came from this island that I found in Creole Bay. Um, so yeah, so this is kind of a a strange uh, oddity. It could have been one of any. I knew I wanted to, to make a found drawing, something that I found, so I just flew around Google Earth. Um, and this, the form of this I thought was interesting because it kind of looks like a living creature almost, like a jumping deer. And maybe this is a head and these are legs. Um, but there's also this bone-like form. Um, and this is me collecting. Morgan took this photo of me collecting my water samples. So you can see how totally gorgeous it is with the willow trees. And again, here's the, the brown. The water is completely full of sediment. Um, and so this is another one of the images from the um, project in Dublin, another one of Lucretius's uh, phrases, no man feels time. This is the Hapney Bridge in Dublin, famous landmark. And so this comes to this notion of time, which is something that's that I've been kind of obsessed with for a long time. My mum has this saying, um, never enough time. She says it maybe 20 or 30 times a day. Um, and it's something that I feel myself. And I don't know if it's an Irish thing. It's probably universal. Um, the world has speeded up so much. Everything happens so quickly. Um, and again, that's, you know, 
to go back to the studio woods in, in the woods in the beginning of the whole talk, that was the one time when I actually did have time to sit down. And um, then I started to think about actual literal time and making time. So this piece is a sun clock and the subtitle is Making Time, where you actually use your own body. Um, you can see here, I think we have a detail. <coughs> depending on what month it is. She's supposed to be standing on May, but I guess the photographer just told her to stand somewhere else. So you, um, um, so this is Storm King. Um, their little museum building is up here, and it's facing north. So I had to you know, calculate how, how do you make the sun clock work, because it's very, very simple. You just use your own body, and depending on what time of day it is, and the month, so that's where the, you've got the months laid out, it tells you the time. But the, something funny happened when I laid out, you know, was installing it. The tech guys at Storm King, they were laughing. They thought I'd made a big mistake because it went from eight here to eight here. And then there was this big gap here. The rest of the circle wasn't there. And they're like, oh, you forgot all the other numbers. And I was like, yeah, but that's when it's dark. You don't have sun. And it was something that Miranda, um, you know, and, and we had that conversation. It was well. And um, so it's just really, really simple things that we take for granted. Um, so this is one of the sun clocks that I made up on the roof of the studio. So the studio, you saw pictures of it, it's huge and it's all there, it's windowless, so it's a giant box and it's fluorescent lighting and I was in there for many, many, many hours every day, mostly on my own. Um, so <laughs> to try and save my sanity, I would pop up on the roof to get some fresh air and daylight and a view of the, look, you can see downtown and the Superdome. So it was totally gorgeous um, and I just, dragged up one of the canvases and I thought, hey, I've got this natural resource, I'm just gonna use it. So what I would do is every hour on the hour, I would just pop up there, so take a break from the other drawings um, and make this sun clock. Uh, and then that connects to more shadow drawings that I made in um, for Storm King. So this was just, these were actually really small, eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper that I placed on the windowsill in the gallery at Storm King. Um, and I would just place them in the same position over like a 20 minute period of time and just drew the, shadows um, oh, and then this is the cities so um, I have over the last couple of years been making city drawings I actually started making them from memory so I um, one summer I started thinking about all the places that I had spent time and lived like Berlin and Paris and Dublin and started to think well can I actually because I remember the city and I have deep connections with them can I remember how they they are and so I started making these drawings and they I was surprised how they ended up looking like these organic growths. Um, and then, so that was one series of drawings. Then I started to use Google Earth to make more exact ones. This was one of Salina, Kansas, the city I was in in Kansas, whoops. And it actually started, this was where the, the city formed and grew out. And I, I animated this drawing. So as I drew it, um, again, it was just another eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. So as I, uh, you know, I would draw for a minute and then s make a scan of the drawing and then draw again for a couple of minutes and then make another scan. So with all of those scans, I stitched them together so you could actually see the animated loop as the city grew. So I tried to draw it as, you know, to replicate the, the timeline of the city itself, how it grew out. And this was uh, Baltimore, I did the same thing. Um, this was Dublin, Ireland. So it used to be, when I was growing up, this used to be Dublin here, then they built this huge motorway when we got all this money, and then now all of this sprawl, it's like, you know, and God knows how, it's just, it's like this growth that just keeps growing. Um, and so New Orleans, um, this was something that I was doing when I was um, on the residency in January, February, was just trying to collect as many, you know, maps of the city, because obviously, you know, it's got such a, a famous and rich history and connection with, like, why is the city here? It's very, very, um, obvious and a well-known fact why the city is located in this particular um, area. Like I love the, you know, that it's called the inevitable city. Um, so I basically what I did was I collected all of these maps and then used them to make one of those animated drawings. So I would start off with the, the beginnings, the bayou, and then come down to the, the what's now the French Quarter. Um, and then as it grows out, and that's what's on the animated um, like the animated drawing that's out in the Great Hall. And I think that's where I'm going to end. I'm really grateful that my voice came back for a minute. I thought I <laughs> wouldn't be able to finish. Um, so that's it, and uh, yeah, now I got to the end. I should say another proper thank you to Miranda um, for inviting me to, to do the project. It's such an honor to work in such a beautiful space as the Great Hall. Um, and Susan Taylor, who um, came from my studio in the first place and um, invited me to come down to stay with Joe and Lucianne at a studio in the woods and they're 
gracious hosting of me and Cammy and Amy. Um, and then having Nina and Christians, their support over the last uh, couple of weeks, well, um, and the last couple of hours. <laughs> Um, and everybody else at the museum. Just a big thank you to you all. It's been um, an adventure. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>